Hi, and thank you for listening to this presentation about collision attacks on small ketchak. Uh, this work was done together with Diane Rotella at Versailles University. Ketchak is a hash function designed by Guido Bertoni, Johan Demen, Michael Peters, and Gilles Van Asch. In 2012, four of its instances were standardized under the name SHA3. It uses a permutation-based model of operation called the sponge construction. The underlying permutation is called Ketchak FB, where B is the state length in bits. For standardized instances, the state has length 1,600 bits, but today we are going to focus on so-called small Ketchak, where the state has length at most 400 bits. So what motivated our analysis of small Ketchak? First, the Ketchak authors have organized cryptanalysis challenges on round-reduced Ketchak instances, Commenting on the results of this contest, they, no they noticed that the smaller versions seemed harder to break. Further, small Ketchak hash functions have been proposed for uses in constrained environments, such as RFID. Here is a tab which sums up the published collision attacks on Ketchak hash functions. As you can see, analysis so far have mainly focused on standardized and thus large Ketchak instances. On the other hand, for the smallest instance, uh, sorry, for the smallest insta instance of the Crunchy contest, here on the bottom line, only collisions with the permutation reduced to one round have been successfully attacked. We designed the first attack on three small Ketchak instances with the permutation reduced to two rounds. Our attack, although not practical, is significantly more efficient than the generic attack. It has been implemented and verified on toy versions and the practical complexities obtained match the theory. So first, uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of the mode on which Ketchak is based, the sponge construction. The sponge construction uses a permutation F, which operates on a state of length B. The state is divided in two parts. The first R bits are called the outer state, and the last C bits are called the inner state. R is called the rate, and C is called the capacity. The message is first padded, then divided into blocks of R bits. It, the message is then absorbed by XORing the message blocks to the outer part of the state with in-between applications of F. Next, in a squeezing phase, output blocks are generated by outputting the outer part of the state with in-between applications of F. Once a sufficient number of output blocks have been generated, they are concatenated and truncated to the desired output length, which we call D. So as you can see here, getting a collision on the output may require getting a collision on several output blocks until their concatenation is big enough to be truncated to the desired output size. And this uh, can be tricky because of the in-between applications of the permutation F. But in fact, this is not the case for standardized instances. This is because the output length is smaller than the rate which means that to get a collision on the output, an attacker needs only getting a collision on one output block. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, in the case of small instances, the output length is bigger than the rate. This means that to get a collision on the output, an attacker needs getting several collision on output blocks. Instead, the, a good strategy is to uh, focus on getting collisions on the inner part of the state or capacity part of the state. We call such collisions inner collisions, and we are going to show in a minute that uh, inner collisions can really easily be propagated to uh, all of the output blocks and thus to the output of the hash function. Note that uh, trying to get inner collisions would have been a very ambitious strategy in the case of the standardized instances because the capacity is twice as big as the output size. On the other hand, for small instances, the capacity is equal to the output size, which means that uh, inner collisions have the same generic security as output collisions.
So how can inner collisions uh, be propagated to all output blocks? Um, suppose you get an inner collision after absorbing the first I blocks of two distinct messages. Uh, in this figure, I equals three and the inner collision is in blue. You can easily choose one last block to make sure that going into the next application of F, not only the inner part of the states, but the whole states will collide. <coughs> and thus, uh, the states will collide during the whole squeezing phase, and thus, so will the output blocks. The inner collision is propagated to every output. <coughs> Um, so at this point, I can now give you a general description of the attack. The general idea is to generate inner states that all belong to a proper subset of F2 to the power C, and then to apply a classical birthday attack on this subset. To generate said inner states, we generate several random long messages and thus get random inner states. Then, for each inner state, which we call S in this figure, we exploit the properties of the permutation F to find a message block M such that the inner state of FMS belongs to a proper subset of F2 to the power C. In order to understand how to generate a good message block for each random inner state produced, we now need to understand how F works. In the next section, I'm thus going to uh, quickly describe how uh, Ketchak F works. Um, so, uh, as you know, F operates on a state of length B. Uh, B is in fact dividable by 25 and the state can be represented in three dimensions. For each Ketchak instance, both the columns and rows are five bits long, but the length of the lanes, on the other hand, varies. In our case, we are interested in lanes of length 8 and 16, which means that the states we consider have either length 200 or 400 bits. A round of Ketchak FB is uh, the composition of five mappings, theta, rho, pi, chi, and iota. Uh, we will uh, not describe iota because it simply consists in the uh, addition of round constant and it's not uh, relevant for our attack because we are studying collisions. So the first mapping is theta. It maps each bit to itself XORed with 10 other bits located on two other columns of the state. The two columns added depend solely on the column to which the bit considered belongs. This means that if two bits are located on in the same column, theta will add the same value to them. The permutation row acts independently on each lane of the state and it rotates each lane. The permutation pi consists in a reorganization of the lanes of the state. Finally, chi is the only nonlinear mapping. It is of algebraic degree 2. It acts independently on each row of the state and maps each bit to itself XORed with the end of two other bits on its lane. Uh, on its row, sorry. Uh, it's the end of one uh, bit of its row and the complementary of one bit of its row. <coughs> so eventually, remember, we want to launch a birthday attack and send each inner state uh, to a proper subset. But to understand how we chose this subset, um, now that we have a better understanding of how Kitchak F works, we are going to go back and study what it means to, for two states to present an inner collision. And we are going to see which properties of F can be exploited to generate them. So uh, the problem is as follows. From two random inner states S and S prime, we wish to find two message blocks M and M prime such that we obtain an inner collision after applying F. Um, this problem can be modeled by a system of C equations which depend on the bits of M, M prime, S and S prime. Since F is two rounds of Ketchak F, our equations ha have degree four. At first sight, it is thus a hard system to solve. Yet we will see that this system is in fact uh, equivalent to a system of degree only two. 
Please take a quick look at where the inner state is located when we present, represent the state in three dimensions. Uh, it is represented in blue in the right-hand figure. So um, here we study inner collisions at a slice level. Here in blue, an inner state collision after two rounds of Kechak F is represented. And now, uh, since chi is a permutation uh, which acts independently on each row of the state, having on a, a collision on a row after chi is equivalent to having a collision on a row before chi, as such. Pi uh, consists simply in a reorganization of the lanes of the state. Thus, having a collision on each lane after pi is uh, equivalent to having a collision on a different lane before pi, but a lane that can be very easily traced back uh, as such. Last but not least, rho rotates each lane uh, independently. So once again, having a collision on a lane after rho is equivalent to having a collision on a lane before rho. So we have gone back up one of the two applications of the only nonlinear mapping chi, and the previous system S is thus equivalent to a system of degree only 2. It is not so clear, however, how to continue to go back up the next mapping, namely theta, because it does not simply consist in um, a reorganization of the bits of the state. However, uh, this difficulty can be overcome by exploiting properties of theta. So recall that if two bits are located in the same column, theta will add the same value to these two bits. This implies that the sum of these two bits before theta will be equal to the sum of these two bits after theta. <coughs> By exploiting this property of theta, we are able to derive necessary conditions on the difference between two states for them to present an inner collision a round later. We show that if two states collide on a column after the application of theta, then necessarily the difference between these two states before theta is constant on the columns. So here uh, on this slide, we show our property for states colliding on four bits of a column after theta. The reasoning is as follows. If two states collide on certain bits of a column, then they also collide on the sum of these bits. Since the sum of two bits of the same column after theta is equal to the sum of these bits before theta, <coughs> The fact uh, that they collide on sums of bits after theta is equivalent to them colliding on sums of bits before theta. Lastly, it is very easy to show that um, uh, states colliding on sums of bits before theta means having a constant difference on these bits, again before theta. More rigorously, uh, having a constant difference on k bits of a column is equivalent to satisfying k minus 1 equa equations of our system S. However, um, recall that our goal was to apply a birthday attack. Therefore, to exploit this property of theta, we need to create a set in which any pair of states has constant difference on their columns. <clears throat> to do so, uh, we decided to simply produce states that are constant on their columns in value. It is then straightforward that if we generate a set, uh, uh, sorry, if we generate a set of states that are all constant on columns, then the difference between any two of these states is also constant on columns. <clears throat> um, how to produce uh, such states is not straightforward because it corresponds to solving a system of C equations of algebraic degree 2. Um, but the only nonlinear mapping is chi, and we decided to linearize it. <coughs> 
To linearize chi, we used two of its very well-known properties. Recall that chi works on rows. Um, so if you allocate a value to an input bit of a row, for example, uh, you fix the value of one bit to zero, then two output bits can be expressed linearly and one output bit takes the same value with probability three out of four. Um, I have now given all the ingredients of our attack. In order to complete the attack, the remaining problem is to optimize allocation strategies in order to construct a good linear system, which satisfies as many equations as possible. I won't go too much into the details of how we optimized our allocation strategies, but I will give an example of allocation strategy. Um, this step is very uh, important because we have a very small amount of degree of freedom at our disposal in small Kitschak. For example, um, for Kitschak with the 200-bit state and a 160-bit inner state, which is uh, the example I'm going to focus on in a second, we only had 40 degrees of freedom, but 160 equations to satisfy. <coughs> so I will start by giving an example of allocation strategy on a slice. Uh, here, we allocate the value 0 to 3 bits before chi, the bits in blue. This allows us to linearize the value of 6 bits after chi. This means adding three linear equations to a linear system and costs us three degrees of freedom. In order to ensure constancy on the columns, uh, sorry, on the yellow bits, uh, rather than adding six uh, equations to our linear system, we only need adding four. Because uh, we do not care about the value of the constant. And thus, we can simply construct a linear equations by summing the expressions of yellow bits and uh, all of that equal to zero. This allows us to save two degrees of freedom. Lastly, note that with probability five out of eight rather than one out of two, we satisfy an extra, an extra equation of S. <coughs> so let's now give an example of allocation strategy on a state. Again, the Kitschak instance considered here is a Kitschak with state length 200 bits and capacity 160 bits. On five slices, we set three bits to zero, and on one slice, we set two bits to zero. This means that we get a linear system of 39 linear equations. Then we produce a state by solving this linear system and uh, thus we get an output set such that for any pair of this output set, 21 equations of S are satisfied automatically and 6 equations of S are satisfied with probability 17 out of 32 to the power 6. We can thus compute the probability P for any two states of this set to collide. Applying a birthday attack, uh, we get a time complexity of 2 to the power 70 uh, times a constant g that we will specify in a minute. Roughly, uh, it can be understood as the cost of finding a solution to the linear system. So, um, how do we compute g? First, note that its value does not depend on the rank of the linear system. This is because to conduct our attack, we solve the linear system a large number of times, and on average, each Gaussian elimination provides 2 to the power r minus e solutions. Further, we can pre-compute the Gaussian elimination before conducting the attack. This means that looking for a solution to the linear system corresponds simply to a multiplication matrix vector, that is, E times C uh, operations. G is thus equal to E times C divided by the number of solutions provided by each multiplication matrix vector, which is also 2 to the power R minus E, 
divided by the number of operations of Ketchak F reduced to two rounds, uh, which we called NO. In the case of our attack example, um, the final time complexity is thus of 2 to the power 73. Uh, note that we do not discuss the memory complexity of our attack uh, because it can be uh, greatly minimized thanks to um, Floyd's circle finding uh, algorithm. So as a conclusion, uh, we tackled the challenge of the Ketchak team and uh, uh, which was recall, uh, if you can recall, that the smaller versions are hard to break. Our cryptanalysis uh, shows that their statement seems true because even uh, two rounds required a strong effort. Most importantly, as a conclusion, we believe that small Ketchak instances require dedicated analysis. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. <laughs>